and the more important the information, the more important it is that we be informed. But then it's also abundantly clear that governments get more than a little bit irrational when it comes to leaks. Governments just don't like whistleblowers. Although in many cases, some of our whistleblowers should be hailed as national heroes for what they've done. Can we forget Bundaberg-based hospital nurse Tony Hoffman, who was the person who went public with her allegations surrounding Surgeon Jayan Patel and undoubtedly saved lives as a result. Here in Australia, we fought hard for workable legislation that protects these brave men and women who risk their jobs and sometimes their liberty to bring us these important stories. Too often the response is a witch hunt of whistleblowers that aims to isolate them, denigrate them, take them to court. For their troubles, whistleblowers too often end up with a criminal record. Now, the federal government has proposed new legislation to protect whistleblowers, but actions slowed in the past 12 months. As a result of the hung parliament and the intervention of independent MP Andrew Wilkie, our lobbying, lobbying has finally given us Commonwealth legislation that provides some protection for journalists, but only in the Commonwealth jurisdiction. And it's critical that all state governments extend this protection in all areas, including in the multitude of statutory investigatory bodies like the Office of Police Integrity here in Melbourne or the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Now, all of this tells us that there's a lot in the WikiLeaks story that we've seen before. Journalists bringing to light information and governments trying to stop them. But what makes WikiLeaks more complex than the run-of-the-mill press freedom issues that we normally confront is that it's a sign of the fundamental change to information and access to information that the internet has wrought. It's the failure to understand these changes that has led governments and even some journalists who should know better, frankly, to engage in what is a last century debate about whether Julian Assange is or is not a journalist. There are plenty of people who want to say that Julian Assange can't be a journalist, so he, can't, he should not be given the same protection as somebody like Laurie Oakes. Leaving aside the meaningless debate of who is or is not a journalist, too many of these people fail to understand what journalism is or how fast and profoundly it's changing. Over the past few months, I've been proud of the fact that the Australian journalism community has shown that it does get it. In December, virtually every newspaper editor in the country signed a petition to our government coordinated by our union, recognising that as a media organisation, albeit a new kind of media organisation, WikiLeaks should be treated with the same respect as established traditional media. As Laurie Oakes himself says, whether it's a letterbox full of classified cables or a quarter of a million documents on a CD, the principle is the same. Unfortunately, within the United States media community, there hasn't been the same understanding. But in the American community, like in Australia, we have to adjust to this shift not stand on a claim to exclusive privileges from last century. Unfortunately, our government doesn't seem to get it either. Initially, they claimed WikiLeaks was illegal and have since spent three months trying to climb down from that position. And now they're invoking some sort of claim to moral force. And frankly, I'm stuffed if I know what that phrase, moral force, means. <laughs> the argument seems to go like this. Denying people the right to know important information about world affairs is morally valid, but revealing that information is somehow morally wrong. Now, I'm here tonight as a journalist to offer my support and that of all the journalists in the Media Alliance to Julian Assange in his struggles. The idea that WikiLeaks has somehow unthinkingly put information up for anyone to see is simply absurd. On the contrary, they've sought out and worked carefully with fellow media groups and professional journalists from around the world 
to ensure that information has been contextualised and sensitive information redacted from the documents. Much of this harm minimisation strategy was suggested by WikiLeaks itself, as New York Times editor-in-chief Bill Keller admitted last week. Keller also said, long before WikiLeaks was born, the internet transformed the landscape of journalism, creating a wide open and global market with easier access to audiences and sources, a quicker metabolism, a new infrastructure for sharing and vetting information, and a diminished respect for notions of privacy and secrecy. Newspapers have been publishing texts of documents almost as long as newspapers have existed. And ever since the internet eliminated space restrictions, we have done so copiously. In other words, in this new digital environment, journalism and WikiLeaks continues to do what journalism has always done, reveal information that is in the public interest in an accurate, timely and responsible fashion. And WikiLeaks and Julian Assange ticks all those boxes. So what it boils down to is this, the criminalisation of information and those who seek to make information public in a century where technology allows and democracy demands that information be free. Now, in November last year, uh, Julian Assange got in touch with the Media Alliance to explain that he might have trouble paying his union dues because, for some reason, his credit cards had been made inoperable and his bank accounts had been frozen. In those extraordinary circumstances, we believe that uh, we would waive his union dues for a time. And so now I'd like to present his Australian lawyer, Rob Starry, with Julian's union card and ask Rob to ensure that Julian receives it to confirm that Julian Assange remains a journalist member in good standing of his union, the Media Alliance.